On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Melissa Ann Kushlack. Board certified gynecologist obstetrician, Dr. Kushlack graduated from Michigan State University with a Bachelor of Science in Zoology. She stayed on in Michigan to earn a Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan and then went to Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, graduating with a Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree. Dr. Kushlack completed her obstetrics and gynecological residency at Botsford General, General Hospital in Farmington Hills, Michigan, where she was a chief resident and developed a strong proficiency in robotic and laparoscopic surgery. She compassionately delivers a full spectrum of health services for women of all ages, from yearly checkups, adolescent gynecolo gynecology, and contraceptive counseling, to menopausal therapy and pelvic prolapse treatments. Dr. Kushlack also brings to the Boulder community valuable expertise in minimally invasive surgery, including da Vinci robotic assisted surgery. She sees patients at Boulder Women's Care in Boulder. Welcome, Dr. Kushlack. Happy to have everyone joining us this evening virtually and looking forward to telling you things that you should never ignore for your gynecologic health. So um, first of all, just a little introduction. I am uh, relatively new to the area. I moved to Boulder in December of 2020. Um, we've already kind of gone through my uh, training there, but uh, Michigan born and bred and trained. Uh, discovered that uh, I like sun in the winter, so discovered Colorado and moved on out here. Um, definitely uh, love being in women's health care. I love uh, taking care of women of all ages. Um, love being in the office and getting to know my patients as well as being in the OR, uh, taking care of them surgically and also on the labor and delivery floor and delivering their babies. So um, I uh, live in Longmont with um, Actually, my three pups now, I haven't even had a chance to update the picture yet, but there's a new puppy at home that I've had for just about a week. <laughs> um, I have no financial uh, disclosures with this lecture. So this is just a quick outline of the 10 things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, we'll kind of go through each uh, issue and how we would evaluate it, and then what we can do for treatment. So first of all, uh, I always want to start with postmenopausal bleeding. Um, so first of all, what is menopause? Menopause is defined as a full year of no periods. Um, so there can be this kind of uh, vague period beforehand that we uh, call perimenopause when periods can be going off and on. And I talk to all my patients during this time that it's important to keep track of when your last period was so that we can know when you have fully reached a full year of no periods. And part of the importance of knowing that is because bleeding after that can um, have significant uh, meaning and consequences. So we need to know if that happens. Um, it really uh, can have many causes, many of which I've listed there, but most significantly uh, endometrial cancer is the uh, first thing that we think about and wanna rule out and make sure that's not happening anytime we hear about bleeding after menopause. Um, we can also catch things early. Sometimes the bleeding can be caused by precancerous cells, so it hasn't progressed yet and we can catch it early. Um, but beyond um, bleeding from the uterus from cancer, postmenopausal bleeding can also be from the vagina, from atrophy, just from infections that are present, um, from hormone replacement, fibroids, uh, the whole list uh, there goes on. But so to evaluate, first of all, I wanna see you and I wanna talk to you. Um, sometimes just from getting the history of what happened, that can kind of help steer us down a certain path. You know, did it um, just happen uh, once? Was it uh, for several days? Is it still ongoing? Was it after any particular event? Was it after intercourse? Was it after a heavy workout? Um, has it happened before? All those kinds of things are important for uh, me to find out when I'm hearing about this. And then of course I wanna do an exam. So take a look at the tissues, find out if I can see any source of bleeding just from doing an exam. 
um, then of course there's lab studies that we can order. So sometimes, like I was talking about, it can be a little bit confusing if you are in menopause or not because of how irregular periods can become. So that FSH is a lab that we can do that can actually tell us if you are menopausal or not. So lab studies can help us, um, testing your other hormone levels, doing a vaginitis culture, which is testing for infection, which can be another cause. Um, but I would say 100% of the time, I'm gonna order imaging also. So we want to take a look at that uterus. Um, a pelvic ultrasound is the gold standard of imaging for the female organs. So anytime we wanna get a good idea of what's going on inside the uterus or with the ovaries, that's what we order. And specifically for postmenopausal bleeding, we know that the uterine lining has a very specific thickness that it should be. Once you're not having periods anymore and your lining isn't building up and sloughing off, we know that that lining shouldn't be any more than four millimeters. And if it is greater than that measurement, then that gives us an indication that we definitely need to sample that tissue or do a biopsy of the uterine lining. So there's different ways that we can do that um, and options that we can talk about. Uh, that's uh, from an in-office procedure versus going to the OR to do it. But very important to get that sample of the lining to rule out the nasty stuff that we were talking about, like uterine cancer, precancer cells. So the treatment is really gonna depend on what we find out is going on. Um, so if endometrial cancer does end up being diagnosed, the good news is that it's a very treatable cancer. So we can refer you to uh, one of our specialists in gynecologic oncology. Treatment is generally a mixture of surgery, um, which involves a hysterectomy, and then may or may not also involve other treatments like radiation or chemotherapy. We have excellent teams out here that we work with um, where the transition is very seamless to get you where you need to go. Um, but the good thing about endometrial cancer is that it typically does give us a warning sign, which is this postmenopausal bleeding. So that's why no matter what kind of bleeding it is after menopause, whether it's a day, a week, a couple days, it always needs to be evaluated so we can catch this sooner rather than later. Um, Precancerous cells, we can also catch it before it's become cancer. We can actually treat medically. A lot of times we'll use uh, progesterone therapy to treat that. Vaginal atrophy, like I mentioned, can also be a cause. So sometimes the bleeding isn't even coming from the uterus. It's coming from the vaginal tissues, which after menopause have less estrogen and can become very sensitive and friable. So we can use vaginal estrogen treatments. There's also different vaginal laser treatments that can help uh, strengthen the vaginal tissues and uh, stop that bleeding from happening. Infections obviously can be treated based on whatever kind of infection it is. Um, sometimes it is uh, from hormone replacement therapy, and that just means that we need to adjust to the dosing or the way in which you're getting the therapy. Hormone therapy can be oral, it can be topical, um, and so sometimes we just need to change up how it's being given to prevent it from causing bleeding because hormone replacement therapy is used to treat symptoms of menopause but should not actually be causing bleeding or stimulating that uterine lining enough to make you bleed. Um, fibroids we'll get into a little bit more with some of the other topics we're gonna talk about, but um, we can definitely treat that. Um, and of dietary supplements, different things we can also discover if nothing else has come up could be um, causing the bleeding. So lots of different options to take care of that problem. So more than one period a month, I would say is a very common thing that I see patients in the office for. Thankfully, this is a problem that most women don't really wanna ignore because who wants more than one period a month? Uh, but a normal cycle is essentially defined as about 28 days, plus or minus a week. So can, uh, your cycle can be anywhere from 21 to 35 days. Um, but when that's happening more than once a month, it's, it's, it could be a sign of something else going on beyond it just being annoying and getting in the way of your lifestyle. Um, so some causes, sometimes it can be from um, certain medications that you're taking, your hormonal contraception, um, hormone replacement, tamoxifen, which is used uh, after breast cancer treatment, um, different hormonal imbalances, so maybe not even involving your specific female hormones, uh, but your thyroid um, or prolactin can all cause um, excessive bleeding structural abnormalities of your female organs. So your uterus can have different extra things going on that can sometimes lead to more than one period a month. Um, anytime we're having irregular bleeding, we also think about pregnancy. So we wanna rule that out and make sure that the bleeding isn't actually something else. Um, and then sometimes extra bleeding is a sign of other things that are going on in your body, um, issues with your liver or blood clotting disorders. 
Um, and sometimes the irregular bleeding is uh, age-related and just due to where your hormones are at at that period in your life. So either very young girls, sometimes your hormones aren't perfectly regulating your cycle yet, or that perimenopausal period that I mentioned, uh, your periods can not just get more spread apart, but they can also get closer together, leading to more than one period a month. So lots of things that we're gonna be thinking of when you come in with that specific complaint. Um, and again, how are we gonna look at that? First, we need to talk about it, figure out how long it's been going on, um, what the pattern of bleeding is, all those kinds of questions. Again, doing an exam, of course, to figure out um, if I can see anything immediately on exam, if I can see a polyp or a fibroid, just for me doing a vaginal exam and looking at the cervix, or if I can feel on exam that your uterus feels larger or um, suspicious for something going on. Um, again, laboratory studies can also give us more information, looking at some of those hormones like your thyroid to see if those are off and causing your bleeding to be more um, erratic. Checking your blood counts to see if this uh, extra bleeding is actually making you anemic, um, which we need to, of course, get to the source of, but can also um, treat the anemia. Um, and then again, a vaginitis culture, make sure an infection isn't playing into this. Even something as simple as bacterial vaginosis or yeast infection can be causing excessive bleeding. And then again, imaging. So especially when we're thinking about all these extra structural things I've been starting to talk about, like polyps or fibroids, that's where we're gonna get the best picture of those is again with an ultrasound, which is the best way to image the female uh, organs. Um, and sometimes when ultrasound doesn't give us quite enough information, we can even look a little further with an MRI. Um, and then even with excessive bleeding, sometimes we do want to, again, sample the lining of the uterus and make sure there's not abnormal tissue or cells in there causing that extra bleeding. So of course, we've gone through a bunch of different causes, so there's gonna be a bunch of different treatments to address each of these things. So um, I would say one of the most common causes can be external sources. So sometimes the new hormonal contraception, whether it be the pill you started or the new Nexplanon or the IUD, um, is causing um, your periods to uh, be a little bit extra initially. And sometimes um, we need to see if things settle down or change the method completely. Um, again, hormone replacement therapy, sometimes Sometimes we need to change the dosage or the way you're taking it. Um, so certainly can change your medical therapies. Of course, if we discover a different hormonal imbalance like thyroid disease, we need to treat that. Um, pregnancy will get you right into some prenatal care um, and systemic diseases, then we you know, tackle those specific issues. Um, but to more specifically kind of talk about the structural abnormalities I've been starting to speak about, um, uterine polyps are quite common. That is just a overgrowth of the normal lining of the uterus. So every month we build up our lining, our endometrium. And sometimes one area of that lining just builds up a little more and causes a little extra projection or tissue. And then essentially you have more surface area to bleed from. So that can uh, quite commonly lead to women coming in saying, oh, my period is lasting longer than normal or I'm bleeding at times that I didn't used to throughout the month or spotting. Um, and that's a lot of times found to be a uterine polyp, which we found on those imaging studies that we've done. Um, and that we can usually go after and remove surgically, but with a very minimally invasive surgery called a hysteroscopy. And that is where we take a camera and when you're asleep and comfortable under anesthesia, we insert it through the, through the vagina, through the cervix and up into the uterus. And then we can see with our camera that polyp and go ahead and use an instrument that goes right through that camera and take it out. And a lot of times just removing that extra tissue um, will help with the extra bleeding. Um, sometimes on our exam in the office, we'll even see a cervical polyp. So that's something I can see right away when I'm doing your exam, just inserting the speculum like we do with a routine pap smear. And sometimes we can see a, a extra tissue right there at the cervix and we can remove that right in the office. And those are quite common causes of extra bleeding also. Um, fibroids, I think, are probably one of the um, most common things I see, just because that's usually what's causing a significant issue for women and brings them into the gynecologist if they haven't been. Um, and certainly, uh, we can manage fibroids from uh, several different angles, both medically and surgically. Fibroids are a smooth muscle uh, growth of the uterus. The uterus itself is smooth muscle, and sometimes we get these extra collections of tissue that can grow generally slowly over time, but as they become larger and based on their 
different locations can cause issues with bleeding for women as well. Um, so to talk about how we deal with those a little bit more, um, you know, I did mention, of course, we can try to manage bleeding medically first, um, if that's the preference, and that's using hormonal contraceptions of any method, whether it be pill or IUDs or Nexplanons. Um, but if the feeling is that the fibroid is too large to really respond to the medical therapy or the preferences to not have uh, extra hormones, then we can certainly go after things surgically. Um, a myomectomy is a procedure that specifically removes only the fibroid. And typically the surgery is done only to preserve the uterus for future childbearing. While it sounds like it would be simpler to uh, just remove the extra um, growth from the uterus, it's actually a more complicated surgery that does involve cutting into the uterine muscle, disrupting that tissue, and then putting it back together. Um, so it certainly can have impact on future pregnancies for women um, as far as uh, depending on how deep into the layers of the uterus we have to go to remove the fibroid. Uh, there may be a need to have C-sections in the future because the risk of uterine rupture with a pregnancy would be too high or deliver uh, pregnancies earlier because we don't want the uterus to grow as much with this kind of surgical history on the uterus. Um, but certainly it's a great procedure to do just that, keep the uterus and allow young women to um, continue to be able to have children. Um, and really how we do that surgery depends on where that fibroid is. So sometimes when the fibroid is actually within the cavity of the uterus or the womb, we can go ahead and use that same procedure that we use for a polyp and just enter through the vagina and put that camera through the cervix and do the hysteroscopy to remove the fibroid. Um, but if the fibroid is on the outer layers of the uterus, that will involve us going into the abdomen to be able to get to that fibroid. So that could be an open abdominal in surgery um, versus uh, minimally invasive with either laparoscopic or robotic surgery. The most definitive treatment, of course, for bleeding issues, like more than one period a month, is actually hysterectomy. So hysterectomy refers to the removal of the uterus and cervix. Um, there is kind of this colloquial term out there, partial hysterectomy, which I think women tend to think refers to leaving the ovaries in place, but actually uh, that procedure to remove an ovary is a completely different procedure called an oophorectomy. So when someone's had a hysterectomy, that only means they've had their uterus and cervix removed. The hysterectomy itself will have no impact on menopausal status because we do leave the ovaries in place uh, unless we need to remove them for um, a separate issue. Um, but so for uh, a lot of women who uh, many times are in their um, late 30s or 40s and have these uh, large fibroids or issues with having uh, periods more than once a month and we've tried other methods um, and this is the only thing left that can get them back to living their life without having to worry about the bleeding, uh, this is the route that we go with hysterectomy. There's really many ways to do the surgery. Um, again, sometimes uh, we need to do it open abdominally, so that would be with usually a transverse incision on the belly, similar to a C-section. That surgery um, is typically reserved for very large uteruses because it's a little bit of a longer recovery with that large of an incision. There are vaginal hysterectomies. Uh, the benefit of this is there's no abdominal incisions. The uh, abdomen is entered through the vagina. Um, the technical difficulty with that surgery is the same thing. Entering through the vagina is somewhat of a blind procedure. You can only see so much of the anatomy, what's right in front of you. Um, and so with um, larger uteruses or abdomens that have had many surgeries before and may have scar tissue inside, might not be the best procedure to be the safest. Um, and then we get into our more minimally invasive surgeries, which of course is how we try to perform hysterectomies most of the time now, both laparoscopic and robotically. Um, both laparoscopic and robotic uh, surgeries involve just small incisions in the belly, usually about a centimeter in size in about three or four different locations. Um, and then the uterus is actually removed through the vagina, similar to birthing a child. Um, the main difference between the two is laparoscopic surgery uh, is sometimes referred to as straight stick surgery, meaning that the instruments that we used are straight. So they go into the abdomen like this, and this is the only ways that they can move. They can't bend um, or do very um, 
fine motions. Uh, and that is where, when the robot came along, um, surgeons were very excited to have much more dexterity. Uh, with the robot, we can actually insert the instruments into the pelvis and then be able to move even our wrists and our um, fingers to be able to move things um, more finely, do finer dissections. So when um, women have had multiple C-sections or multiple surgeries inside the belly, there could be more scar tissue. And so the robotic surgery is really gonna let us do the finest dissection in the most complex cases, the safest, um, with the camera allowing the greatest uh, magnification of everything um, and the actual instruments themselves Themselves, allowing us to work uh, the cleanest inside the pelvis. Um, and studies have also shown that uh, patients recover more quickly um, from the surgery and are up and moving around faster. Um, I would say 98% of my robotic surgery patients go home from surgery the same day and are um, certainly requiring some pain management, um, you know, with pills and things like that, but nothing further than that and up and moving around and getting back to life a little bit faster. So definitely some benefits um, of that type of surgery. But essentially, um, hysterectomy being the most definitive treatment, that's how we're going to get rid of that extra bleeding that you're having um, by getting rid of the uterus. So moving on to the next topic, heavy periods. So sometimes you may only be having one cycle a month, but it can be very heavy. So um, the average uh, length of uh, bleeding is about four days, plus or minus two. Um, and a heavy period is defined as bleeding more than either a week, so more than seven days, or bleeding more than 80 milliliters. Um, and so what is 80 milliliters? I always say it's about um, the size of a double espresso. And that is for your entire period. Um, so certainly if you're bleeding that much in one day, that's excessive bleeding. But even if that's what your bleeding is adding up to over a week, that is excessive bleeding. Um, and a lot of women might not necessarily realize that, that their bleeding is excessive because this has just been their period. Um, so that's an important thing to talk about when you're having your exam with your gynecologist is just going over what your your normal period is to you because what your normal period is might actually not be normal. Um, so again, heavy periods uh, need to be evaluated by all the ways that we are used to hearing about now. So hearing the history, is this something new? Has this always been going on? Does it happen every month, just some months? Um, again, our exam, looking for things that I can see right off the bat. Do I feel a uterus that feels larger or differently shaped? Um, doing our laboratory studies. Again, looking for other um, hormonal abnormalities like thyroid conditions, uh, checking your blood counts to see if this heavy bleeding is leading to anemia that also needs to be treated. Again, looking for infection. And then again, doing our imaging to take a look for those structural things that we've been talking about, uterine polyps or fibroids. Um, and then again, potentially doing a biopsy of the uterus if it looks like there's the possibility that some abnormal cells inside the uterus could be causing that extra heavy bleeding. So um, similar causes, uh, honestly, to our previous topic. Um, a lot of times it can be from external sources like the particular hormonal contraception you're taking or hormone replacement. Um, again, thyroid disease, all those structural lesions we just talked about, uterine polyps, cervical polyps, um, pregnancy. Uh, that can sometimes be a surprise. It might not actually be a period, but an impl implantation bleed. Um, and then again, discovering other uh, conditions. Uh, the, the menstrual cycle is considered a vital, a vital sign for women, and um, when it's off, it can lead us down the path to figure out other things that are going on health-wise. So missing periods for months at a time um, is the next one I wanted to talk about. Um, some women are actually happy about this because maybe you don't want to have your period every month. But again, um, the menstrual cycle is really a vital sign for women and we shouldn't be ignoring it if uh, it's not coming because that can be a sign that something else is going on. So um, oligomenorrhea is the medical term for missing periods. Um, amenorrhea is the term for never having a period. You can have primary amenorrhea, which is when by the age of 15, a uh, female hasn't developed a cycle yet. And secondary amenorrhea is when you did at some point have your cycles, um, but then go up to six months without a cycle, and then that needs to be looked at also. Um, but essentially, missed periods, I think, most commonly are associated with PCOS. Certainly other causes uh, can be identified, like um, high prolactin levels, thyroid disease, um, early ovarian failure, um, and intrauterine adhesions. 
But again, we need to evaluate this issue. So again, history, exam, lab studies uh, can get a bit more specific here, especially when we're thinking about um, PCOS. Um, so looking at different hormone ratios and um, also testosterone levels uh, can give us some clues as to if uh, PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome is going on. And uh, what I also like to point out about PCOS is that despite its name, it's actually usually more of a clinical diagnosis than an imaging diagnosis. So um, although uh, one of the criteria can be having the appearance of uh, multiple cysts on the ovaries on an ultrasound, you can also um, not even have that appearance of your ovaries and still have PCOS. The Rotterdam criteria is the most commonly used criteria by gynecologists to diagnose PCOS. And it's basically three different uh, criteria that if you have two out of the three, you are considered to meet diagnosis. So the three are hyperandrogenism, so that's referring to high testosterone levels, which we can do labs and look in and discover it that way, but also clinically we can say if we have um, women with excessive male pattern hair growth, like hair on your chin or your chest, um, that can be a sign of hyperandrogenism and we don't even have to do the lab, we can just see that that's happening, or excessive acne are all signs of hyperandrogenism. And then having these um, spread out cycles that we just talked about, oligomenorrhea is another symptom, as well as uh, uh, piece, uh, the polycystic ovaries on an ultrasound. So even if you have two out of the three, you would consider to meet criteria for PCOS. So um, PCOS and just in general oligomenorrhea or skipping periods really should be treated. Um, it uh, can have other implications uh, it's, it's essentially a hormonal imbalance, and the fact that your hormones are imbalanced could mean other things are going on um, inside the body uh, in terms of different metabolic syndromes, increased insulin resistance, so higher risk of diabetes, um, higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, for women who have early ovarian failure, meaning essentially going into early menopause, um, sometimes I'll see those patients in the office and they'll be happy, like, I got rid of my periods early, except that loss of estrogen and an early stage before your 50s uh, can lead to early bone loss, early heart disease, early dementia, so really we need to replace that hormone when you're young. So um, there's different treatments depending on where you're at in life. Um, this slide is specifically kind of talking about PCOS. So for women who are not pursuing pregnancy, a combined oral contraceptive pill is considered the first line therapy for PCOS. Um, we can also add in metformin and different antiandrogen medications to help with the symptoms um, and the extra hormones that are floating around in the system. Um, but of course, some women are of the age that they are trying to pursue pregnancy, so they're going to come in and not want to go on a, a contraceptive pill, which is completely reasonable. So um, for those women, a 5 to 10 percent weight loss um, has been shown repeatedly in studies to increase fertility. Um, of course, with PCOS, the hard truth is that it's also more difficult to lose weight. So um, adding in metformin can help with that. It can help uh, with weight loss and decreasing some of those excess hormones. Um, and then there's also different things that we can do in general just to help women with PCOS get pregnant. With um, PCOS, you're usually not ovulating, so we need to help uh, get those ovaries ovulating um, and different um, reproductive uh, techniques can help with that. Um, there also are some uh, good studies on different supplements that can be used uh, for treatment of PCOS, myonistatol, um, and those are some of the things that we can um, come through in the office when we're you know, diagnosing this and really trying to get you back to a state of good health. So painful periods, certainly not something women should ignore. Hopefully you don't want to ignore that either. Um, basically, we kind of look at this as, is this a new sudden thing or is this uh, more chronic? Um, sudden onset of a very painful period could have very emergent um, implications. That could be something uh, serious like ovarian torsion where the ovary has slipped on its own blood supply, an ectopic pregnancy, or an abscess in the fallopian tube. Um, things that are more chronic in nature and need treatment but not necessarily trips to the ER all the time can be endometriosis, um, fibroids, ovarian cysts, different infections, um, and actually uh, different organs can be causing uh, pain in the pelvis too, like the bladder or the, butt, the uh, guts. 
So again, our evaluation, I'm sure you're used to hearing this now. I want to get a full history and figure out how long this has been going on, what exactly is going on, do our physical exam, um, get some labs if it seems indicated, and get some imaging. So treatment very uh, much depends on what exactly we're trying to treat. So uh, endometriosis, fibroids, cysts can be treated um, with medical therapies like hormone treatments. Uh, Oralissa is a newer medication on the market targeted at the pain of endometriosis. Um, certainly if we've de discovered an ovarian torsion or ectopic pregnancy, those can be surgical emergencies and need to the, go to the OR right away. Um, endometriosis is something that we can treat surgically, go in and try to find lesions in the belly and remove those to try to help with the pain. Um, and then alternative treatments, you know, things like acupuncture, um, that certainly have been shown to help also. Uh, Belvoir itching. Not something you want to ignore either. Again, um, this can be sudden or chronic in nature. Um, can be not just itching, but burning, dryness, discharge in general. Honestly, there's a very large list of things that this could possibly be. So really, you need to come in for evaluation for this so that we can take a look. Um, and uh, a lot of times we need to do a biopsy of the tissue. And that's done um, with a small punch biopsy, which is what the picture is kind of showing there. Um, takes about a three or four millimeter um, piece of skin that I can send to a pathologist for them to look at it under the microscope and make sure that this is some sort of benign skin condition versus, of course, vulvar cancer. We want to rule that out. If there's any sp suspicion for that, then of course we need to do biopsy to get a real diagnosis. Um, treatment, again, is going to be kind of varied depending on what we found. Sometimes we just need some topical steroids. Sometimes the issue can be that postmenopausal vaginal dryness and lack of estrogen for the vaginal tissues, and for that we'd use topical estrogen. Of course, um, infections are going to be treated based on the specific infection. Um, and surgically, sometimes we do need to excise a lesion um, if that's considered necessary. So painful intercourse, um, we kind of think about this in both premenopause and postmenopausal women. Um, so for premenopausal women, uh, painful intercourse, we want to think about is this all of a sudden brand new or has this been going on for a while? Certainly this can be a very multifactorial issue. It can be both um, physical as well as due to um, uh, emotional trauma or um, you know past history. Uh, their causes can be anatomic, um, where ovarian cysts can be um, causing discomfort, things going on inside the pelvis essentially causing discomfort, or pelvic organ prolapse. When the pelvic organs are coming down into the vagina, that can certainly be causing discomfort with intercourse. Um, and then there's also different medical uh, conditions, uh, vulvodynia referring to um, painful intercourse um, due to the, the tissues of the vulva that we can treat in different ways. Uh, infection can um, present uh, as new painful intercourse. And then um, hormonal contraception, um, specifically the pill and the depo shot, are known to uh, increase vaginal dryness over time. So sometimes uh, women will come in and will have been trying to look into this for a very long time and no one's come up with anything. And if we take them off their pill or their shot for a few months, the vaginal tissues um, kind of uh, get a little bit healthier and come back. So that can definitely be something to think about too. So again, our usual evaluation, we need to do our history or exam and potentially do some cultures or biopsies to figure out what's going on. And then treatment is gonna be really varied based on what exactly we're trying to treat. So ovarian cysts um, that aren't large in size, uh, usually uh, six centimeters or less, sometimes we can try to treat medically, uh, starting on a form of birth control that will actually suppress the ovaries, so keep them from ovulating and keep you from forming cysts, um, can sometimes help uh, prevent that in the future. Endometriosis, we can try to treat medically by suppressing the cycle, either with hormonal contraception or with Lupron. Um, vulvodynia um, is uh, the condition I was talking about of the vulvar tissues that can cause painful intercourse. Different um, medications, actually tricyclic antidepressants have been shown to have significant impact with that, as well as pelvic floor therapy, sex therapy, topical lidocaine to actually reduce the pain. Um, of course, infections are gonna be treated specifically based on the infection. And then switching, if we do find that hormonal contraception is the um, causing the the painful intercourse, then we can actually um, try non-hormonal methods like the Paragard IUD, um, or there's also um, a new uh, gel insert that is non-hormonal that can be used. 
Um, and then surgically, of course, we can treat uh, ovarian cysts uh, surgically by removing them. Endometriosis I talked about, we can go in and try to remove those lesions. Um, and then pelvic organ prolapse, depending on which organ is prolapsing, we can also treat surgically. Um, and then alternative treatments like th sex therapy, um, acupuncture also has been shown to help. Postmenopausal painful intercourse also can be multifactorial. Um, but generally has a bit of a different cause, most commonly from vaginal atrophy, again, due to that lack of um, estrogen leading to uh, the tissues of the vagina becoming more friable and thin, more easy to tear, and uh, causing dryness and discomfort. Um, again, you can still have infection or vulvodynia even postmenopausally. Um, sometimes this is really when we're also identifying the pelvic organ prolapse that typically can take longer to develop and is more common later in life. Um, and also from vaginal atrophy, we can actually have narrowing of the entritis, which is simply narrowing of the opening of the vagina that can make penetrative intercourse difficult or even impossible for women. So again, I need to see you, I need to talk to you, I need to do an exam, uh, potentially some um, laboratory studies if I'm worried about the skin tissues, maybe some biopsies, if we're thinking about the pelvic organ prolapse, maybe some imaging different treatments based on what we're trying to treat. Um, so the most common with postmenopausal women, I would say being uh, the vaginal atrophy that is typically treated with topical estrogen, um, or I should say vaginal estrogen. We can give vaginal estrogen in several ways. Topically with a cream, there's different uh, inserts uh, that we can use or pills that you can stick in the vagina that will dissolve. And there also are now um, oral medications that are specifically targeted at um, postmenopausal painful intercourse. Um, pelvic floor therapy is usually a big component that I try to get most women started on um, to help with the pain, but also just to keep your pelvic floor musculature healthy and strong is going to help um, prevent um, UTIs and um, just keep your pelvic floor healthy. So that's always a good route to go. And that can really help. Um, they can help you with you use dilators if the issue is the narrowing of that opening. Um, there are also a lot of vaginal lasers on the market. There's some varying studies as to if those are truly um, doing the job that we want them to, but the lasers like uh, Mona Lisa, um, is one of them, uh, the Diva is another one. Uh, essentially, the thought with those is that that uh, laser treatment is going to increase collagen production and make the tissue stronger. Um, so for some women who don't want to use any kind of hormone like the estrogen vaginally or have to mess with a cream or whatnot, that could be a good option also. So abnormal lesions I bring up mainly to uh, make the point that you really should be looking at the vagina and the vulva and you should be feeling. Um, hopefully you're coming in every year for your annual pelvic exam with a gynecologist, but that's only once a year and if something pops up sooner, um, you should come in and get that checked out. Um, things that can be concerning are if it seems to be growing, the lesion that you noticed, if um, there are multiple lesions that are spreading, if of course they seem very painful or irritating. Um, and the first things we usually think about is, is there some new product um, or medication that you're using that could be contributing? Um, but again, standard evaluation with a history exam, labs, biopsy. Um, this is just a smattering of things that we can find. Um, this, again, is a, is a quite a large differential, so really we need to get you in and see you and take a look. Um, and then treatment, of course, is going to be very, very depending on what we find, but different medications or surgeries or alternative treatments can help. Um, but the big thing with this, too, is just don't be shy. Bring it up. We're gynecologists. This is what we do all day. Um, so don't, don't feel like it's different or weird or we, you're embarrassed to tell us about it. That's what we're there for. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is kind of a constellation of um, symptoms that um, basically have been associated with ovarian cancer. So I do uh, see a fair number of women who will come in and ask, you know, how can you screen me for ovarian cancer or how can I make sure I don't have ovarian cancer? And um, unfortunately, ovarian cancer is known as a silent killer because it doesn't typically have many symptoms until it's uh, very advanced stages. And unlike, for example, the pap smear, which we have as a screening tool for cervical cancer, we don't have a similar screening tool for ovarian cancer. So what we do have, family history, um, certainly um, you, discussing your family history with your um, doctor as far as who's had things like different breast cancers, 
um, colon cancers, certainly if there's been ovarian cancer in the family, can give us some indication of you know what your genetics show, um, as well as ask the question, do we need to do some genetic testing to figure out if you do have different genetic mutations that we know are associated with an increased risk of cancer. Um, but as far as the most commonly reported symptoms that we see women coming in with and then we end up discovering ovarian cancer, that includes um, bloating, um, noting that your abdominal um, size is increasing or you're feeling very bloated all the time, your pants feel uh, tight even though you don't feel like you're eating different, um, certainly abdominal pain or pressure. Um, difficulty eating or feeling full quickly. Um, and these are all generally a result of, unfortunately, the size of the mass at that point, um, causing pressure on your other organs. So again, evaluation in this case is going to be um, history, exam, imaging. The one laboratory study that we do sometimes use when we find on imaging a lesion of the ovary that may be suspicious is called CA-125. This is a blood test that actually came about in order to monitor known ovarian cancers. So for patients that we know have um, ovarian cancer, we can you know, remove the actual cancerous lesion, but then still follow this blood test to figure out if there's other um, if there's still cancer present in the body by following it up and down. Um, but we do sometimes use it um, just as a screening to see if, if when we have a lesion on the ovary, if we think it's suspicious. Um, and then this is uh, just a little uh, indication of what can give you an increased risk of ovarian cancer. Like I mentioned, your family history, um, different genetic mutations. Most commonly people have heard of the BRCA gene mutation, but now we have um, quite extensive genetic uh, screening tools that can test for many genes that are associated with different types of cancer. So we can talk about that in the office. Um, more likely in postmenopausal or essentially older women. So anytime you're over the age of 40, essentially is when your risk for ovarian cancer increases. Things that decrease your risk of ovarian cancer over your lifetime, if you have carried a pregnancy, if you have breastfed, and if you've used oral contraception. All of these things are time periods when your ovaries were not ovulating. So the less your ovary um, has ovulated, the lower the risk of your uh, ovarian cancer is. So um, if we do find ovarian cancer, of course, that would require referral to a gynecologic oncologist, um, and treatment would be a combination of surgical and medical. So those are my slides for tonight. That's Mr. Oliver, my second youngest now. <laughs> Hopefully I haven't put you to sleep. Um, but I'm happy to see uh, any of the women in our community in the office, and happy to answer some questions if there are any. Dr. Koschlak, thank you so much. That was very informational. We do have some questions that have um, started coming in, and we want to remind our audience that now is the time to ask your questions in the chat box, and we'll get to as many as we can tonight. Great. These are in no particular order, and um, I'll just start right out. So this person asked, um, is it typical that endometrial and ovarian cancers are usually at an advanced stage by the time they're diagnosed because there's no warning signs? Uh, they had a 65-year-old friend uh, had stage three endometrial cancer following a radical hysterectomy, and she basically didn't have any symptoms or warning signs. So um, I would say it's actually more typical. So the two I would say are different, endometrial cancer versus ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is very common to be diagnosed late stage without any symptoms um, or very vague symptoms beforehand. Endometrial cancer unfortunately can have that same result, but much more commonly endometrial cancer is caught very early and it's from the postmenopausal bleeding. That's a very common symptom that endometrial cancer will actually show. That's the uterus showing us that something abnormal is going on. So I would say it's much, much more common that we catch endometrial cancer early, although not impossible, um, certainly, unfortunately, for it to be found later. Okay, thank you. Um, do you treat lichen sclerosis in postmenopausal women? 
for sure, all of the time. <laughs> uh, and that, so that is um, one of the ones that, uh, so that's, a, I would consider, you know, an abnormal vulvar lesion. And that's one of the ones that I, you know, mentioned can have a big differential, but certainly um, highly recommend coming in and getting seen. This is something that's very common, uh, but sometimes not recognized until you get to a gynecologist. So some women are having their annual exams um, with their primary care, which is, um, absolutely fine and many primary cares uh, do that uh, but when something is uh, there's a discomfort that hasn't been um, successfully treated yet that's when you come on down um, and yes we definitely uh, can recognize this and get this under control it is definitely a chronic condition and sometimes if it's been around for a long time it can take several months of treatment to get things calmed down it's really an inflammatory issue and getting that uh, tissue healthy and calmed down and happy again can take some time but definitely definitely we treat that and can help with that okay great uh, remind me, will you still have a period after a hysterectomy? You will not. So the period results from um, the uterine lining building up and sloughing off. So with the hysterectomy, we remove the uterus. So there's no more uterus to have a period from. Um, like I've mentioned though, we do typically for premenopausal women leave the ovaries. So you're not gonna become menopausal, meaning you're not all of a sudden gonna have hot flashes and night sweats. Um, and that set of symptoms, but your periods will be gone forever after a hysterectomy. So do you need to come in for an annual exam after a hysterectomy? You absolutely do. So even after you've had your uterus removed, you still, depending, may have your ovaries in place inside, but all women who, you still have a vagina, you still have a vulva. So all of these conditions of the vagina and vulva, like lichen sclerosis, vulvar cancer, um, all those things can still happen. So you still need to have an exam, including a pelvic, to look at the vagina and vulva, even after a hysterectomy. On an annual basis? Depending on your age, most typically either annual or biannual, but that can be tailored to your specific conditions. Um, so after the uterus is removed, what are the ovaries attached to? The ovaries are attached to your pelvic sidewall. So that is a very common question. And uh, in the office, I have all kinds of diagrams. But um, your ovaries do have a ligament that attaches them to your uterus. But actually, the um, strongest ligament and the ligament that contains our blood supply attaches the ovaries to the sides of your pelvis, essentially. So they aren't just free floating. They still have their blood supply. And they are held in place by that ligament. Okay, that's good to know. Is it normal for someone with PCOS who misses periods to still experience cramps but no bleeding? That can happen, yes. Essentially, the um, hormones of PCOS, you can still get your uterus getting in, um, in, inflamed and angry and cramping. The actual bleeding from a period comes when your endometrium, the lining of the uterus builds up and then sloughs off. And that is a piece that's missing for PCOS. So you can still have that cramping and discomfort and kind of feel the other different hormonal symptoms of a period, but not have the actual bleed because your, your uterine lining isn't um, quite in line with, with what your cycle would normally be doing. Okay. Um... This person is already in menopause, but pre-menopause, uh, pre um, they used to pass huge blood clots. They were always a sudden occurrence and led to some embarrassing moments. Do you know what was happening and what can be done now to reduce and prevent them? Well, once you become menopausal, you shouldn't pass those anymore because you should be no longer bleeding. So if that ever happened, definitely need to go in and get imaging done. Um, my first thought would be that potentially there are some uterine fibroids, some uh, a larger size uterus with more surface area to bleed from, and that during those heavier periods when you were still menstruating, that's what created this big collection of blood because you had so much tissue to bleed from, and then it would pass all at once. And it can happen where, you know, it's not every period, so but sometimes that's how it would go with the, with the larger fibroid uterus. 
Even with a fibroid uterus, though, that has gone into menopause, if you've truly had a year of no periods, your, your lining shouldn't be building up, your fibroid shouldn't be being activated, so it shouldn't happen again. Um, and if it does, then that's an episode of postmenopausal bleeding that we need to look into. Okay, good to know. Uh, does spironolactone have an effect on estrogen and progesterone levels? It really shouldn't. Spironolactone is an antiandrogen, so it's aimed at the testosterone type hormones and decreasing the symptoms of hyperandrogenism, um, like the uh, hair growth in places that women don't expect it, like chin and chest and excess um, uh, uh, acne. But it shouldn't. Um, it, it shouldn't really be affecting your estrogen and progesterone levels now. Okay. Uh, this person is almost 80 years old. Uh, do they need a pap test anymore? Cause they've never had any problems. That's a great question. Um, and no, you don't. So standard uh, screening recommendations for pap smears are that women at 65 years old, if you've had no abnormal pap smears within the past 20 years. So someone who's 65, it comes in and tells me, oh, at 18, I had one abnormal pap smear. That's far enough in the past. We don't have to worry about it. But at 65, if you have a pap smear that's normal and you haven't had an abnormal for 20 years, you are considered aged out of pap screening. Now that is pap screening. So the pap is a specific test that takes some cells from the cervix and tests for cervical cancer. That is not a pelvic exam. So at 80 years old, do you still need a pelvic exam? Not every year, especially if you're not having any problems. But I would say every couple years, should you still have an exam? Yes, because you can still develop lesions of the vagina and the vulva and things like that that we talked about. Or certainly if you had any symptom, like if you, you know, new onset of itching or discomfort, then certainly you should come in. But you don't need pap smears anymore. And I would say if you're not having any issues, you don't need a yearly pelvic exam, but you should still have uh, probably a bi-yearly or every three years or so. Okay. Uh, this person said, if I have cramping but have been in menopause for five years, is that a concern? There hasn't been bleeding associated with it. Um, I would say generally no, but that's probably something I would want to talk a little bit more about. My initial thought would be um, I would want to try to figure out if this is really uterine cramping going on. You know, is there something else in the pelvis going on? Like, is this actually more GI related as far as your bowels um, or urinary related or something else? Generally, if a mom's sister, mom's sister have had bread breast cancer, shouldn't I stay away from estrogen therapies? Uh, no, and it's, well, that is a little more history I would need, but I would say the short answer is no. So depending on the age of mom and sister's diagnosis is one thing. So when breast cancer is diagnosed at older than 40 years old, it's not considered to be um, necessarily is genetically linked. My other initial question is, have either mom or sister been genetically tested? And do we know, like, is this a BRCA-related disease, um, like a genetic uh, known mutation? And do you have that mutation also? But say I have a patient whose mom had breast cancer at 65 and her sister had breast cancer at 50. Um, I mean, definitely we need to keep up on our screening, but um, you are not... Uh, you know, 100% precluded from estrogen therapies if there is a condition going on that we need to use that for now. Okay. Can cysts on the ovary turn cancerous? How often should a woman get those cysts checked for any uh, changes? So um, a cyst typically isn't going to turn cancerous. It's once it develops, it is cancer. Um, ovarian cysts are very common. Ovarian cysts are the result of the ovaries fall, um, having uh, their normal process of ovulation. So the ovaries every month are supposed to form a whole bunch of follicles. One becomes a dominant follicle. That's where you ovulate from. And then the ovaries should kind of suck back in all those follicles and then do the whole thing again the next month. 
However, sometimes it's quite common for a follicle to stick around for a couple months. And that's where maybe we've done an ultrasound for some other reason, like you are having you know, painful intercourse, and we found a small two centimeter cyst. To me, that is highly unconcerning. It's probably a follicle that's just stuck around. Sure, we can repeat an ultrasound and make sure it goes away. And honestly, even if we repeat an ultrasound and you have another two centimeter cyst, I can't guarantee you that that's the same cyst that was there before. It may have been that that cyst went away, you ovulated again, and now you formed a new cyst. So um, really it's not uncommon to see ovarian cysts that are small in size and to see them repeatedly, especially when the ovaries are, you know, you're not on any kind of hormonal contraception that's um, suppressing your ovaries. So I don't get concerned when I see something small like that that's been around for a long time. Certainly there are different um, ways that on uh, ultrasound, we have different things that we look for that can make a cyst look more suspic suspicious as something that's more abnormal than just a simple follicular cyst. So we do have things that we're looking for, but it's generally not so much that something sticks around for a long time and then all of a sudden it's cancerous. Usually when something abnormal develops, that's how it had started. Okay. This person is 60 years old and at the Nine Health Fair, the doctor found a lump behind their nipple and believes that it's probably a cyst. Um, they didn't necessarily want a mammogram, but would an ultrasound be good at discerning what that lump is? So ultrasounds are, of the breast are good at discerning if that lesion is a cyst. Um, I would say, uh, so it's reasonable to just get the ultrasound. The If it doesn't look like a cyst, then we're gonna need the mammogram. Typically, radiologists will prefer a mammogram first to figure out if they even think it's potentially a cyst, but there's nothing wrong with doing it in the opposite order where you do an ultrasound first and see if, yeah, th this does look like a fluid-filled cyst. And that is uh, the most common way that we diagnose breast cysts is with breast ultrasound. Okay. Um, I've heard that nursing decreases the risk for breast cancer. True? Yep. Oh, that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this person has painful periods, um, having a little trouble getting the doctor on board. Uh, do you have any suggestions for trying to uh, make sure there's not something, an underlying medical uh, problem that needs to be diagnosed? Uh, they have been offered hormonal birth control. Right. Um, essentially, uh, an ultrasound of the pelvis is what's going to look at the uterus for the structural things that we've been talking about, like fibroids, which can cause increased cramping. Um, endometriosis in and of itself is more honestly of a clinical diagnosis. So an ultrasound is not always going to show us endometriosis. There is a very particular type of cyst called an endometrioma that we can see on an ultrasound, and that can give us an indication that there may be endometriosis going on inside. But unfortunately, there really isn't imaging other than this one specific cyst, which you may or may not have if you have endometriosis, um, that's going to give us that diagnosis. So a lot of times we do try to clinically diagnose um, endometriosis by suppressing the period uh, with some sort of hormonal contraception. And if the pain goes away, then we can infer that the pain was from the cycle. And by suppressing the cycle, we've removed the pain. The only way to um, truly uh, pathologically diagnose endometriosis is to do surgery. So to have a laparoscopic surgery where we look inside the belly, see if there's a lesion of endometriosis, um, and if, if we see what we think is one, we remove it and then have the pathologist look at it under the microscope. And if they can show that there is endometrial tissue that we pulled from somewhere that's not inside the uterus, so for example, on your fallopian tube or on your ovary, then that diagnosis endometriosis. Some patients definitely prefer to have this surgery and have this distinct answer. Um, what I always talk about is that that's certainly an option, um, but it's not necessarily going to change the treatment. So if you aren't excited or wanting or in, in a good place to have a surgery at that time, it's also reasonable to try to medically just treat the painful period um, and see if that takes care of the problem. Thank you very much for all of uh, this information. It's been very helpful tonight.